everybody. I'm Bonnie Herbe, host of PBS's To the Contrary. This week, we have the great honor of having with us Congresswoman Donna Edwards, a former representative, Democratic representative from Maryland, a regular on To the Contrary, and a columnist for The Washington Post. So great to see you, Donna. Great to be with you. Thank you, Bonnie. There are so many things we want to talk to you about, Donna. Um, first of all, let's start with all the violence and protests and the death of George Floyd and all the uh, horrible things that have been happening in the last week or two. Um, violence. Is this the way the president should have been dealing with violent protests? Well, you know, first of all, let's start with, you know, describing it was the murder of George Floyd. We all watched that nine minutes. And I think that, unfortunately, we have a president of the United States. We know that he has not had the capacity to be empathetic in so many other circumstances over his tenure. Um, but particularly in this moment, we need a president who's able to offer a healing voice to the American people, and particularly to speak to uh, African-American people about the racism that um, leads to uh, an officer piercing his knee into the neck of George Floyd. And this president is completely incapable of doing that. And in fact, he's used his bully pulpit to be more of a bully and to incite, um, I think, additional violence and um, to raise the temperature when he should be a president who is lowering the temperature. It's really shameful. Um, do you think these, all these episodes, I mean, obviously Michael Brown was, I guess, before Trump was president. So it's not as if police brutality against African-Americans is a new thing. Unfortunately, we were all hoping with Michael Brown or even before that, that it would have ended, but it keeps on going. But in some way, is President Trump responsible for the murder of George Floyd? Well, I mean, it, you know, keep in mind that just in the couple of months before George F Floyd was murdered, uh, Bri Breonna Taylor uh, down in Louisville was murdered when police on a no-knock warrant bust into her, burst into her apartment and she you know, was shot eight times uh, in her night clothes. Um, it is you know, not police violence, but um, people who've been given license to act as vigilantes, uh, chasing down Arbery, uh, Ahmaud Arbery um, in Brunswick County down in Georgia. I mean, and so, um, this litany of either people acting like vigilantes and, you know, doing things like weaponizing 911 to make calls on black people and, and law enforcement, of course, you know, engaged in their uh, tactics um, against black people, men and women. Um, it's been too much of a string. And I think that what happened is that George Floyd's murder and the way that we could see that and feel that and him calling out to his dead mother um, to try to save him, um, it was just so heart-wrenching that I think it is, has brought this really um, to this, you know, moment that really calls for presidential and political leadership to address these questions so that we can deal with the deep systemic racist uh, racism that happens in this country. And the president of the United States, I have to say, he fuels this. I mean, we can think back to his words in Charlottesville, both, you know, good people on both sides. I mean, we can think back to him, uh, even in his language the other day, as he threatened the use of uh, the military against Americans, uh, talking about the Second Amendment. I mean, these are all signals that the president uses. And I believe that, you know, it's designed to incite, you know, these confrontations around around race. And believe me, I do not think it is an accident on his part. Well, not, on, not only threatened to use the military against American citizens who are exercising their constitutional rights to voice their opinion about things, and obviously, there are professional looters in those groups who are go who are doing 
way worse than that who are criminals and should be arrested by the police. But it, the the bulk of the crowd, especially that was tear gassed, was walking peacefully by the White House with signs. I mean, that's all they were doing. And then the helicopter that descended on the crowd. I mean, this this has not, the Posse Comitatus um, Act has not been invoked since, I believe it was I, the Eisenhower administration. Is is that, is there anything Congress can do in response to this or should do? And is that the correct behavior for a president overseeing a country torn apart by race, really, and, and you know, all civil rights issues at the moment? Well, you know, I think if we were, if we were writing about human rights violations in another country um, run by an authoritarian government, um, we could have been writing about what happened in multiple cities across this country and certainly what happened within the purview of the White House um, at Lafayette, uh, Lafayette Park. And I have demonstrated many times, I can't even count the number of times, at Lafayette Park. And I have never seen anything like that. And the, the crowd that was there was a peaceful crowd. And the way that uh, federal law enforcement, because it was this array of federal law enforcement, because the District of Columbia is not a state, and so there are all of these law enforcement agencies that have jurisdiction. And the way that they marched upon those peaceful demonstrators, I think is, a, is shameful in a country that calls itself the greatest democracy in the history of the world. We were not demonstrating greatness uh, in that moment there, and nor has the president been demonstrating it either from his bunker in the White House or in his, you know, what I describe as sort of a pimp walk across the White House over uh, to St. Uh, John's Church. Um, so let's switch now to uh, the future of American politics. You have been an advocate of uh, former Senator, former Vice President Joe Biden for a long time. Overall, how do you see his record on race? Uh, I feel really strongly that now that we have, you know, our likely nominee with these last closing days of, of primary elections, uh, that it's important for us to rally behind that uh, him as our nominee and to make certain that um, he is able to re um, replace what, who I believe is an imposter, a poser in the White House in Donald Trump. And um, I would say that my political leanings, however, have been you know, sort of more in line with the Elizabeth Warrens um, of, uh, of the, um, the primary season. And of course, all of the women who, who ran, because I think it's time to have a woman in the White House. And, uh, but I'm excited. I was excited about the array and the field that we had. And now I'm excited that we will have a nominee who I believe will you know, bring dignity, dignity into the White House. And you know, based on some things that he said, even in the wake of this tragedy with, uh, with George Floyd, Floyd um, that he will, you know, take on these issues of racial injustice and police violence and give that real voice and give our anger a voice in the White House. Give it a voice and do what to placate? What can the president do to stop, or any president can do to stop police violence against black people? This is generally speaking, a city and state law matter, not a federal law matter. Well, let's be clear. I mean, um, these uh, law enforcement agencies, state agencies, local agencies, um, uh, uh, cities receive an awful lot of federal support. Um, and I think it is time for the Congress of the United States, the president of the United States, to begin to condition that support on real change, uh, fundamental change in policy um, in these um, law enforcement agencies, in training, in civilian re uh, review boards, and those kind of things. And I think that the federal government actually has a lot of levers uh, that it can use in that respect. I mean, um, the Department of Justice every year gives out, you know, billions in grants to local law enforcement agencies. That needs to be conditioned on them rooting out um, the, the culture that leads to 
um, the, the tragedy that we saw on the streets of Minneapolis and that we've seen all across this country, and some of them not even resulting in death, but harassment, detention, um, and, um, and brutality against black people. Do you think this nation can, can get there? I mean, when I, when I see these things happen, and I've read so much of history of the Civil War, and it seems to me that certain people still think it's you know pre-war times, that they're allowed to literally get away with murder as long as they murder a black person. Um, it, it just is amazing to somebody who, who's standing back and watching these things evolve that this is still happening in our country in this time. So what do you think, what do you think the reality is about stopping it or the real prospects, I should say, of stopping it and getting beyond racial problems? Is, is it ever going to happen? Well, it, it's a long road, but I will say one of the things that's actually been deeply gratifying in watching um, the news coverage of crowds, you know, all across this country has been how multiracial um, these crowds are, how multigenerational these crowds are. And so that tells me that there are, an, uh, that, you know, there are many Americans, black, white, Latino, Asian, you know, across the board who believe that we should be behaving differently and that we should have different expectations of law enforcement. And so that is actually gratifying because I do believe that it is a small cadre of the American people who still harbor uh, these racist beliefs that, you know, have come from, four, you know, 400 years of enslavement through Jim Crow, through the modern civil rights movement, and somehow they want that all, all back. And I don't believe that they are a majority and we have to stand up and fight against them. And, you know, I do. And, and so I am hopeful, Bonnie, in that respect, but I don't think that this is going to be easy. And I also think it means that we can't be complacent anymore and that white people have to start talking to white people about their racism and calling it out. When you hear somebody saying something that's untoward because they're in a safe, comfortable group, don't let that go unchallenged because those are ways that we really, we can fight back against this deeply embedded culture that has been with us since uh, Africans first came to this continent and were enslaved. What about reparations? Uh, Bob Johnson, prominent sports team owner in North Carolina, formerly in Washington, DC, and one of the co-founders of BET, um, called for reparations recently. He's certainly not the first person to do so. Do you think that's ever going to make its way through Congress? I, I don't know about that, but what I do think is that ideas like that about how to um, restore, you know, dignity and economy uh, to black people um, is a conversation that's worth having in the Congress and in the White House, and that. Um, it could be that that takes many different uh, different forms. But as long as we have, you know, a, a, a group of people in this country who uh, a, across the board, you know, have higher rates of, of poverty and, and, and chronic illness and all of the things that plague uh, these communities, we are not going to lift up all Americans. And I think it's time for us to face that. And, and I think it's time for... Uh, the Congress of the United States to have that conversation. And if the conversation is around reparations, I don't know where that's going to go, but I think it's a good conversation to have. What do you think is the biggest issue splitting Democrats and Republicans and really splitting grassroots voters uh, th that, uh, that in, you know, comes from the racial uh, area that that what is what is the biggest issue that divides us for example um you know there are white people who are for, for civil rights and justice but don't think that they should have to pay reparations their taxes should go for example to reparations because their families weren't even in this country when slavery was an institution um or there are or uh immigration there are, Trump has stirred up um, enough 
you know, talking about the border and all, and all, all his focus on pretty much without saying the word Hispanics and inciting hate against people. Um, is that the biggest issue dividing people on, along racial lines? What is it? What do you think it is? Is it education, health care for everybody? Uh, Bonnie, this is like a really big question, and I don't know, but I know that it's worth the conversation. I know that it is, is worth the challenge for policymakers to examine these questions deeply. And frankly, you know, if you think about it, I mean, think about the, the you know, position and status of our, our native communities. Uh, right now, on uh, Navajo territory, they're suffering some of the highest rates of COVID infection and, and, um, uh, and, and death. And um, that is owing in huge part um, to a healthcare system that hasn't been invested in, education that hasn't been invested in, and communities that have been left behind. You look at immigrant, new immigrant communities, especially um, Hispanic er immigrants, and you see the challenges that are being faced by those communities left completely out of our our healthcare system, unable to attain uh, citizenship because of our policies. And then, of course, African Americans. Um, you know, we could we could have a, a program that lasts for days and days and days, uh, talking about the circumstances of of uh, disparities in in healthcare and income and education. And so we have to be able to chew, walk and chew gum at the same time. And it means that we're going to have to tackle a lot of these policy questions um, together and some of them more specific to other communities. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at our census, this country is growing in terms of its, um, its uh, black and brown population. And we need to embrace that as something that is positive instead of you know, having this you know, small group of people challenge us to believe that we cannot really exist in a multiracial country where everybody has an opportunity to succeed. Uh, let's get back to Joe Biden's candidacy for a second. You, as a Democrat, obviously will support him, but you can't endorse him because you're now a journalist and an, an opinion writer. Um, but what about, you, uh, about him scares you the most as a candidate? Well, I mean, look, I think that um, his choice of the next uh, of his vice president, I think, is uh, an important one, different in some ways from choices that other um, presidential nominees have had to make. Uh, somebody who could be president, as I say, yesterday, um, I think that's going to be a really important choice. I also think that um, it's important that we push uh, the former vice president in terms of um, whom he surrounds himself uh, with um, in these important cabinet and sub-cabinet uh, positions. Um, that we want him, we want to challenge the former vice president to be more bold in the solutions that he embraces. Um, and I think that he's up for that challenge. I've known him for, I think, 30 years. I can't even believe it. Um, knew him as a senator working on the Violence Against Women Act, and I knew him as somebody who can grow into his leadership. Um, I knew him when I was a member of Congress working with him as, as vice president, and I have a deep regard and respect for him. And I believe that he's up to the challenge of being challenged, and that unlike uh, the current occupant of the White House, he will not view that at, with umbrage, um, but with humility. And, um, and so I have a lot of confidence, but I think that anyone who goes into the White House deserves to be challenged by those of us who are outside. It is not fair for any president, whether it's uh, Joe Biden or anybody else, uh, to get a free ride, uh, because sometimes free rides lead to a lack of accountability. And I want Joe Biden to strive to his highest capacity, and I know that he can do that with accountability if we challenge him. And what about his vice presidential pick? Will he get the black and brown vote if he doesn't choose? He's already said he's going to choose a woman if he doesn't choose a woman of color. I think that, of course, he is going to get um, the overwhelming share of the vote from black and brown people 
um, uh, come November, um, because we know what's at stake. When um, Donald Trump said, what do you have to lose? We know that what we had to lose was our lives. And so we're not gonna, we're not gonna be fooled by that or tricked into submission and staying at home and not voting. And so I'm excited about that. And I have said that I'm actually fairly agnostic about the choice that the uh, former vice president makes um, for vice president. And part of the reason is because I think that uh, choosing a vice president is also a very personal um, choice uh, where you want to choose somebody that you know you can work with, where you will be a team, where you can trust them uh, eminently to deal with issues both international and domestic. And I think that it's important for him to choose somebody who, uh, who compliments him, who doesn't, uh, and that is with an E, um, who doesn't um, uh, 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 go along with everything but challenges him um, it, it privately and advises him. Uh, somebody like he was a vice president who is more of a peer so that you trust their judgment. And I'm going to trust the judgment of Joe Biden to make the choice that is going to make his four years in the White House a success. Why do you think uh, people of color are going to turn out for him overwhelmingly. It's always a problem for Democrats to get people of color to the polls. I've never quite understood that, but it exists. Republicans go out and vote in droves regardless. They don't need, you know, as much of a GOTV get out the vote effort as the Democrats have to put into getting their voters to the polls. What is it? Will it? Is it COVID-19? Is it lack of health insurance? Is it racial disparities in the country. What do you think is going to get uh, voters of color out this time? Well, I think that we've already seen through the primary season, and we certainly saw in 2018, that um, voters of color were highly motivated. I think that Democrats would not have regained um, the House of Representatives had Democrats not been very motivated, and particularly black and brown Democrats. In some of these districts that only had you know, 10% uh, uh, or so, uh, and less than that of black and brown people in their districts, it was the super turnout of those voters that actually made the difference uh, in those elections. And so I am confident, um, and you look at Joe Biden's performance during the primary season, black and brown voters showed up for him, and they showed up for him in a big way. Otherwise, he would not have been able to secure the Democratic nomination. And so, and I think that there are a lot of us, um, a lot of my former colleagues and uh, others who are going to be out there, you know, on the stump uh, for, for Joe Biden, and not just turning out black and brown voters, but turning out young people. Uh, in, you know, I think the fact that uh, Joe Biden is embracing um, messages around uh, climate change and the importance of dealing with that is going to be an important motivator. Um, for young people to come out to vote. And so I'm excited about what the prospects are. I don't think it will be easy. I think in the, um, you know, with the era of COVID-19, I think it's going to be a very important for us um, to really focus on making sure that people understand vote by mail in their states and that they're willing to do it. And most polls are showing that people are highly motivated to vote by mail. And you know, Bonnie, I just read a very interesting study that was done about vote by mail showing that black Americans are more predisposed than their white counterparts to vote by mail. And so I'm confident that this can happen. Um, getting back to Biden for a second and his VP choice, um, why don't you think it should be a woman of color? You seem, I, you, well, actually, Bonnie, I didn't say that. Well, you, did, but you didn't say it should. You didn't say it should be, and you talked a little bit about Elizabeth Warren. Um, it, you know, if it were to be a woman of color, do you have a favorite? I think it would be fabulous if uh, Joe Biden chooses a woman of color, but I don't think it is absolutely necessary. And I'll be excited uh, to do what I can to make sure um, that we have a president in the White House who has respect for the American people and wants all of us to be included in its future. 
Thank you so much, Donna Edwards, a former representative, U.S. representative from Maryland, current, uh, currently op-ed uh, writer for The Washington Post and uh, regular on, on NBC, MSNBC. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate seeing you. And that's it for this edition. Please uh, join us next week. And in between, please follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, etc. And uh, please join or look at, rather, our PBS website at pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, please join us next week. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more. PBS. <laughs>